everybody, and welcome to this uh, Monterey uh, conversation. Without intending any disrespect to our previous uh, conversations, let me say that this is the grand finale uh, of the of the fall season. Uh, great powers, uh, and uh, you sort of naturally constitute a, a grand finale to the conversations we've been having this fall. Uh, and there will be a spring season of Monterey conversations, and we'll be publicizing those uh, not too far from. Uh, not too far from now. I want to begin just with a few thank yous to Altenay Yunusova and Anna Vasilyeva for making this possible and also for the generous support of the Carnegie Corporation for uh, making all of this uh, possible. Uh, it's my great pleasure. I'm Michael Kimmage, Professor of History at Catholic University uh, and Senior uh, Associate with CSIS. It's my great pleasure to introduce two very distinguished uh, speakers today. I could give long introductions for both of these speakers. I'll just uh, uh, do the briefest of, uh, of introductions, but uh, we're honored uh, to have both of them uh, present and to be able to learn from their uh, sort of great, uh, great insight and engagement with this very important question of, uh, of great power. So going in alphabetical order, uh, Corey Shockey is Senior Fellow and Director of Foreign uh, and Defense Policy Studies at the American Enterprise Institute. And I would like to mention two book-length publications because I think that they're uh, very relevant to the conversation we're about to have. Uh, and this is America versus the West, Can the Liberal World Order Be Preserved, published in 2018 with Penguin, uh, and Safe Passage, The Transition from British to American Hegemony, published in 2017 with Harvard University uh, press. So lots of great power overtones in the titles of both of those uh, publications. And that takes us quite naturally to Ali Wine, senior analyst uh, at Eurasia Group uh, and uh, in 2022, which is to say very recently, uh, uh, Ali published America's Great Power Opportunity, uh, Rethinking U.S. Foreign Policy uh, to Meet the Challenges uh, of Strategic uh, Competition. So I'd like to begin I suppose, with the most recent of the publications, uh, with the one titled Great Power Opportunity and with Ali and ask him just for uh, a few moments to summarize the key findings of the book and the key insights. And then we can turn from there to uh, to Corey's uh, response to, to these ideas and uh, that should get our conversation going. Well, great. Uh, thank you so much, Michael. Uh, what a what an honor and a privilege to be part of such a such an esteemed series. And, and I do have to say, just before sort of diving into uh, some of the arguments in the book, uh, I was just saying this before we we joined the call. Before Corey joined the call, uh, what an honor and privilege, Corey, it is to be talking with you. I was telling Michael that, uh, and you may not remember, uh, but you were you were the the scholar come practitioner who gave me my very very first opportunity to speak about great power competition. When is that you were right? In <laughs> It's absolutely right. So July 2019, thankfully, before COVID, when you were at IISS, you gave me my very first opportunity to speak uh, on, on this topic. And many of the suppositions that I set forth in that presentation that you so generously gave me the opportunity to deliver uh, found their way uh, in various forms uh, into the book that, that Michael generously flagged. So um, I was saying to Michael, one, you gave me my very first opportunity to speak on this topic. Number two, uh, you're a giant of strategic study, so it's that much more of an honor to speak with you. And three, I was saying to Michael beforehand that I feel that you are, Corey, part of an increasingly rare uh, breed of folks in D.C. who engage in debate, dialogue, discussion vigorously, but constructively, cordially, civilly. And so for all of those reasons, it just... Well, it's such I curtsy my process. thanks for all that avalanche <laughs> of compliments, my friend. <laughs> Just being honest, I, and, and I, I wanted to, to make sure that, that I, I began by began with those with those uh, acknowledgments. Um, so I'll, I'll be very brief uh, in terms of just some of the arguments that I try to put forward uh, in the book. So I think the first argument that I want to, to lay out is when we think about great power competition, I try to posit a distinction between thinking about it descriptively, that is kind of as a, as a distillation of geopolitical, prevailing geopolitical conditions, and prescriptively, that is as a blueprint for U.S. foreign policy. So descriptively, I think the great power competition has a lot to recommend it. I don't think that it necessarily captures the totality of contemporary geopolitics. But then again, I don't think that any one term or any one construct or any one framework could distill the totality of contemporary geopolitics. But descriptively, I think that it gets a lot right. It acknowledges that interstate competition, at least since the Treaty of Westphalia, 
uh, it's been an immutable feature of geopolitics. It's waxed and waned in intensity, that is interstate competition, but the fact of interstate competition for the better part of four centuries has been a core component of, of geopolitics. And I think that the, the resurgence of, great, of interest in great power competition, the resurgence of focus on great power competition as a potential policy framework acknowledges that very important fact, number one. Uh, number two, great power competition recognizes that the United States faces two principal nation state challengers. They're different in terms of their material capacities. They're different in terms of their foreign policy strategies. They're different in terms of their strategies for undermining uh, U.S. national interests. But nonetheless, uh, a resurgent China, a revanchist Russia, I think the great power competition properly identifies uh, two uh, principal nation state challengers. And therefore, it also recognizes that the United States, while remaining the world's preeminent power, it's relatively not as preeminent as it was, say, at the end of the Cold War or, or at the turn of the century. So descriptively, again, I want to emphasize, I think the great power competition gets a lot right. Prescriptively, that is, as a blueprint for U.S. foreign policy, I think it becomes a little bit more problematic. So I'll, I'll just briefly set forth a few critiques and then, and then I'll stop. Um, so three critiques that I, I try to advance in the book. Um, the first critique of great power competition prescriptively as opposed to descriptively is I think that it places the United States in a reactionary defensive mode from the get-go. And if you have a foreign policy that is not exclusively, but but in substantial measure oriented around the actions and maneuvers of your competitors, um, you're allowing them in substantial measure to dictate the terms of competition. And so I worry if the United States places itself in a position in which it subordinates affirmative decision-making to reactionary measures. So what is China going to do? How does the United States respond? What is Russia going to do? How do we respond? Now, I hasten to caveat my own critique by saying the United States can't and shouldn't construct foreign policy in a vacuum. A substantial part of U.S. foreign policy necessarily is going to be reactive. When China takes decisions that undermine U.S. national interests, we have to react. When Russia engages in brazen territorial aggression, we have to respond. So the first critique is not to say that the United States can or should construct its foreign policy in a vacuum. It can't. The first critique is just to say, recognizing that a significant component of your foreign policy is necessarily going to be reactive. What can we do to carve out as much room as possible for affirmative uh, decision making that transcends the decisions of our competitors? So the first critique is saying, let's not allow China and Russia, our competitors, to dictate the terms of competition and drive our foreign policy. That's that's the first critique. The second critique, which is uh, quite related to the first one is, and it's a critique that I actually think should be a source of quiet confidence uh, for uh, for the United States, not unbridled confidence, not arrogance, but, but a quiet confidence is, I think that if in the immediate years after the Cold War, the United States made the mistake of succumbing to complacence, I think that there's a risk now that if we lean too far or too heavily into great power competition as a policy framework, that we run the risk of having the pendulum overcorrect in the direction of consternation. We don't want to underestimate the competitive potential of China and Russia, but we don't want to aggrandize it either. And I think one of my big takeaways as we approach the end of 2022, one of my big takeaways has been that for all of their much vaunted strategic acumen, I think that China and Russia, albeit in different ways, I think that both of them have proven to be remarkably self-limiting competitors. Uh, Russia, I think quite obviously with its just a remarkable act of strategic self-sabotage, leaving aside of the how hideous and barbarous an invasion it's been, but just strategically, if you look at where Russia is today, militarily, economically, technologically, diplomatically today, versus where it was on February 23rd, 2022, the day before it launched its fateful invasion of Ukraine, I think it's difficult to see how on any of those dimensions of power, Russia is materially today better off today than it was uh, prior to its invasion of Ukraine. So Russia is dramatically undermining its own strategic outlook. China, uh, albeit not as, uh, as brazenly and albeit not as clumsily or ham-handedly as Russia, but it too is undercutting uh, its strategic outlook, particularly by quite gratuitously alienating advanced industrial democracies. And these advanced industrial democracies still wield the balance of global power. So however vaulting your ambitions might be, if you're China, uh, it's not particularly strategic to alienate the advanced industrial democracies that still wield the balance of global power and whose trust you would need to establish whatever international system you might envision. So the second critique is to say, let's not be complacent. Let's not also succumb to consternation because that consternation 
feeds into a reactionary defense of foreign policy. The third and final critique, and then I'll stop. And this critique is, is an unpalatable one to articulate. It's an uncomfortable one to articulate when you see the barbarism that Russia is inflicting upon Ukraine, when you see uh, the crackdown on protests that are occurring in China right now that we saw over the weekend. Um, when I wrote the afterword to uh, America's Great Power Opportunity, uh, I tried to imagine in my mind a scenario in which the United States could advance its vital national interests by bypassing China and Russia and solely engaging with like-minded countries. And I just wasn't able to do it. I think that China and Russia, for better or for worse, I think they're likely to be enduring competitors, not transient ones. And so then the question becomes, if you accept that proposition or that hypothesis that they're likely to endure rather than collapse, the question becomes not how do you forge a decisive or how do you achieve a decisive victory over those competitors that you believe to be transient, but instead, how do you forge an uncomfortable, strained, a tenuous cohabitation with two competitors that you believe will endure. And I think that the imperative of cohabitation requires that we maintain some baseline of diplomatic exchange, uh, not out of charity, not out of altruism, but out of abiding self-interest so that we can uh, assure our own vital national interests in dealing with the full range of transnational challenges. So that's my third and final critique. I probably have already gone over for too long, but why don't I stop there? No, please, that timing. Thank you so much, uh, Ali, for that very, very rich. Uh, uh, beginning to the conversation, let's pass the baton to, to Corey. It's not for a rebuttal, but just for a, uh, a response to these three ideas and to this framing of the, of the discussion. Yeah, so I very much like Ali's book, and I also like the way he's drawn out the Russia and China arguments in his recent foreign affairs article. I think these are really important conversations, um, and people of good faith can come down in different places and actually both be right. Um, I have a different take on the issues than Ali does. I think at least the first two of his critiques are not critiques of great power competition as a strategy, but of that strategy played badly, right? There's nothing inherent about viewing the international order as one of competing great power states, all that requires is the existence of great powers and, and quite possibly the existence of great powers with different domestic political compacts. Um, it does seem to me that a piece of Ali's argument that I'd like to draw him out on is how much is great power competition a function of ideology and the tendency of great powers to try and reorder internationally uh, the, to make the international order a macrocosm of their domestic political order. Because in fact, there are more that great powers than just Russia and China and the United States, as you point out. I mean, Russia's GDP is roughly Italy's, which puts it outside the G7. So Germany, Japan, South Korea, there are lots of great powers in the international order. Um, and what is characteristic about America as a great power, again, which is a function of its domestic political compact, which is the tendency to sort countries as threats by ideology, not by power. Um, and the great advantage, what has made American dominance of the international order cost effective and therefore sustainable, is that most of the other successful countries in the international order have similar domestic political compacts to the United States. So we're not threatened by Germany, we're not threatened by Sweden, because we look at their domestic political order and it looks familiar and therefore safe to us. Uh, so, so first, I don't think uh, I don't think reactive strategy is a necessity. I also don't think it has been American strategy. You know, I think actually American grand strategy has been pretty consistent for most of the time of the United States as a great power, both with the Soviet Union and then with China. The United States has had a mutually beneficial outcome strategy, right? Come on in, the water's fine. If you play by the rules of the international order, you will grow strong and prosperous 
as our allies and we have grown strong and prosperous. What changes, and this is my second critique of Ali's framework, is not American strategy acknowledging other great powers or uh, reacting. It is the choices of those great powers that have defined the competition. It is a China that is a threat to the rules-based international order by refusing to comply with the rules that not just the United States, but the majority of other countries, great, medium, and small in the international order have also chosen to support. The main beneficiaries of the international order that feel so threatened by Russia and China aren't the United States, it's the Philippines, it's Ukraine, it's the small and middle powers that don't have the ability to protect themselves and establish rules mutually beneficial. The third, uh, Ali's third challenge, I think is the most interesting of the three. Um, because it, again, goes to the shape of the order. And I think he underestimates, uh, I, I think he raises a really important and accurate critique, which is that if we play into great power competition being all we are doing in the international order, we actually play to our adversary's strengths, right? Right. Russia has an economy the size of Italy. It is not even the best military in the former Soviet Union. Um, it is being defeated by Ukraine with the assistance of Western powers. Uh, and as Ali points out in his excellent foreign affairs article, its economy is now um, irredeemably unproductive and has alienated the markets for its main uh, export. So um, our adversaries are making a bunch of mistakes and, and that's advantageous to us. But I think he, again, underestimates the ideological basis that makes the confrontation, um, uh, that makes it impossible to escape the confrontation. We feel threatened by a Russia that behaves this way. Our allies feel threatened by a Russia that behaves this way. And the fundamental sorting rule of the American-led international order is that borders only change by mutual consent, not by conquest. And the challenge Russia has posed to that has organized 50 countries into a league of assistance to Ukraine. That's America's superpower, not our global share of GDP, which, you know, is roughly 25 percent. Even if it's dropped from 30 percent, it dropped from 50 percent at the end of World War II, mostly to countries that are America's allies in the international order. So we don't grow less strong by the erosion of our dominance we grow stronger by the strengthening of our alliances. And I know you actually believe that, my friend. <laughs> well, before turning the, the floor back to, to Ali and, and, and uh, giving him a chance to, um, you know, sort of agree or disagree where he sees fit, I did want to ask one further question uh, of you, Corey, based on the title of your, your 2017 book, um, or rather the 2018 book, um, uh, and it's implicit to some of the points that you've made already, but the, the liberal world uh, order, I myself worked in, in in the State Department from 2014 to 2016, we would have been very comfortable with that phrase uh, then, the liberal world order, and we would have been not uncomfortable with the phrase great power competition, but it wouldn't really have occurred to us. It would have sounded, I think, a bit uh, zero sum, uh, or that we would have imagined that for President Obama, it would have sounded a bit zero sum. And then of course you had the Trump administration come in and that was one of the key phrases of the Trump administration was great power competition. There was a kind of way in which that was almost celebrated by the Trump administration. This is how the world is. And we have to sort of acknowledge the realities of that. And then the Biden administration comes in and does seem to in some ways square the circle. I think it's kept a bit of that great power competition framework, but it's very committed uh, to the you know, uh, liberal international order, liberal world order. I mean, you know, you can, you can use different phrases to describe 
what's more or less the same thing. I did want to ask you, Corey, your sense of the evolution of this notion in American foreign policy before we turn the floor back to, to Ali. I think you have it exactly right, Michael. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, it seems to me the Trump administration could never identify what its end game was with, in competition with China. And I think that's instructive because it actually didn't change from, I think American strategy towards China has been largely consistent since 1973, which is the zealot formulation of responsible stakeholder. We favor a strong, prosperous China, provided that it plays by the rules that made the rest of us strong and prosperous. And to the extent it doesn't, we will work to counter the pernicious effects of its rule breaking. President Trump, you're exactly right, Michael. President Trump, you know, was chest thumpingly aggressive about it and was willing to squander America's great strategic advantage, which is the fact that other states also want what we want and are working to assist us in those ends. And President Biden, returned to playing team sports, again, with the same objective. And the emollience of the Biden administration, you could almost feel a huge sigh of relief by other countries to see the United States policy return to recognizable dimensions. Um, and, and I think the end hasn't changed. What has changed? is the increasing clarity of successive American administrations that China doesn't want the responsible stakeholder um, framework that we and others have offered it. And therefore we and our friends and allies need to take a more proactive approach to enforcing the rules and a more proactive approach to, as Ali rightly recommends, to uh, assertively shaping the order to strengthen our ability to prevent China from changing the rules. Thank you so much. So I just want to paraphrase, uh, uh, you know, as best I can, what may be the sort of intellectual difference between the two of you before passing the baton back to, uh, to Ali that, um, uh, Great power competition uh, and uh, liberal international order, Corey, I think in your view are, are you know, sort of necessarily compatible, uh, that there's a kind of overlap uh, and intersection. And it's the way in which the U.S. sort of navigates that uh, divide that will perhaps determine the quality uh, of American foreign policy. And Ali, I'm going to ask you if you think that there's maybe less compatibility there, that this may be a bit more of an either or proposition, and that's why you need to emphasize great power opportunities or cooperation to the extent possible, um, or to at least put that on par with this notion of great power competition. If I've gotten that wrong, please correct me, but I'm just trying to hone in on what really may be the difference in outlook here. Ali, the, the floor is now yours. No, so I actually think, um, and not surprisingly, uh, I basically agree with everything Corey said. And, and in particular, I, I wanna emphasize, I mean, there, there are two points I wanna emphasize that I think are so important. I, I really like, Corey's notion that America's superpower is its network of alliances, which I think is, is absolutely right. And it brings to mind, I often find myself revisiting an op-ed that Yan Shui Tong from Tsinghua University, he wrote an op-ed, this was, I think, a little over a decade now, he wrote it in November of 2011. It was an op-ed for the New York Times entitled, I, I don't think he chose the title, but it's a sensational title, I don't think he chose it, that's the, the editor's prerogative. But the title that was chosen for his op-ed was, and this was in 2011, keep in mind, it was How China Can Defeat America, so not very subtle, but... So he, uh, Professor Yan, in this op-ed, he spends a lot of time enumerating what he believes to be America's competitive disadvantages and what he believes to be China's competitive advantages. But there's a very critical part of his op-ed in which he says, and I'm, I'm roughly paraphrasing him, but it gets to Corey's point. Professor Yan says in this op-ed, he says that the core of competition between the United States and China is going to come down to who has more what he calls high quality friends, essentially allies, allies and partners. And Professor Yan has been banging this drum ever since writing that piece. And he's been advising the Chinese government 
that until and unless China is able to establish a network of high quality friends comparable to that which the United States has, it's going to be very difficult for China, however evolving its ambitions might be, it's going to be very difficult for China to overtake the United States for global, pre uh, for global preeminence. And I would actually argue, I mean, forget about global preeminence, I think it would be difficult for China even to overtake the United States for regional uh, preeminence in the Indo-Pacific, the way that it's carrying on. I mean, just by way of a thought experiment, if we rewind the clock to, let's say, early 2020, so April 2020, May 2020, we all remember what the narratives were about the United States and China in early 2020. What were the narratives? The narrative was, at the time, in 20, early 2020, that China had successfully contained COVID-19 at home. It had successfully mitigated the worst of the economic recession associated with COVID-19. And having done so, having demonstrated its calm, its composure, its confidence, it was now training its sights outward. And it was going to help the rest of the world recover from COVID-19. What was the narrative about the United States? The narrative about the United States was basically the antithesis. The United States can't contain COVID-19. It can't contain the recession associated with the pandemic. It's being convulsed by protests against socioeconomic injustice. And there were many observers in early 2020 who said, my gosh, are historians and political scientists going to look back in retrospect and look at early 2020 as a real inflection point that marked the beginning of a real power transition between the United States and China? And I think that China had kind of a great power opportunity of its own in early 2020, given that discrepancy in narratives. Imagine if China had said, you know, we had the United States exactly where we wanted. We're going to, not indefinitely, but temporarily, we're going to stop cracking down on Hong Kong temporarily. We're going to stop intimidating Taiwan temporarily. We're going to take steps to shore up or at least stabilize our relationships with Australia, India, Japan, South Korea. We're going to get this major investment agreement with the European Union across the finish line. And we're going to try to take some steps to basically put a floor under our relationship with the United States. And to, as, a, as a bonus that China might have thrown in, we're going to take stock of all the debt that's owed to us by Belt and Road Initiative uh, recipient countries, and we're going to relieve that debt partially or in full. I think that if China had taken any of those steps, I think that it would have been in a vastly different and better position. But if you look at China, where China is strategically today versus where it was prior to the arrival of the Biden administration or prior to the onset of the pandemic, I think strategically it's in a far less advantageous position, largely because of self-inflicted mistakes. And if you look at, I mentioned Professor Jan Zaped, if you go back even further to 2005, the very famous foreign affairs essay articulating how China would achieve a peaceful rise, a core premise of that essay was in 2005 that China is going to, it's going to avoid the mistakes that previous rising or resurgent powers have made, and it's going to establish stable relations with its neighbors in the Asia Pacific. It's going to, it's going to establish stable relations with major powers more broadly. With the exception of China's relationship with Russia, and I think there are questions about is Russia a major power or a great power, but let's just say for argument's sake that it is. But leaving aside its relationship with Russia, I feel that one could argue that virtually all of China's major power relationships today are either stagnating or deteriorating. You look at the way that, and it's not just the United States, look at the way that NATO now talks about China. Look at the way, look at the recalibration that's going on in Brussels. Uh, look at the reinvigoration of the Quad. So I think that to, to just all the way of underscoring Corey's, uh, Corey's point that America's superpower is its network of alliances, and that's why. Now, is that network of alliances, can we take it for granted? No. Is it under strain from within and without? Yes. But is it still, I think, an unrivaled strategic asset? Absolutely. And so I think the United States needs to be thinking about what, what can it do to, to ensure that that network of alliances goes from, from strength to strength. Um, and then a parallel point. Uh, that I want to make, and again, underscoring a point that Corey made, kind of another superpower that the United States has, or I shouldn't say another superpower, but it's a, uh, it's a superpower of which this network of alliances is, is, is a part, uh, the existence of uh, the post-war order that the United States still substantially undergirds. Now, again, is that order, can we take it for granted? No. Is it under duress from within and without? Yes. But the mere fact of its existence, it's existed now for now approaching 80 years, uh, it began largely as a response to the Soviet Union, and it began uh, it began in a largely bipolar world, but it now has substantially diffused, and it's substantially diffused to the point that one of the principal beneficiaries of that order has been none other than now America's principal geopolitical competitor, China. I always go back to this op-ed written in 2016 by Fu Ying, who was then, um, I, th I think in 2016, she was still chair of uh, China's Foreign Affairs Committee. 
She writes an op-ed for the Financial Times in 2016. This is in early 2016. Now, most of the op-ed, it consists of inveighing against the U.S.-led order. She says it's hypocritical, it's immoral, it's not reflective of the global balance of power. But there's a very crucial caveat that Fu Ying stipulates in this op-ed. And she says, we, meaning China, she says, we have to concede that the U.S.-led order has made immeasurable contributions to peace and prosperity, and that China has been one of the principal beneficiaries. And so even though the U.S.-led order, it's, it's creaking, it's, it's, its frailties are becoming more manifest, one of the challenges that China has is the more vigorously it invades against that system, the more it betrays the impoverishment of its own alternative conception. And the more that China talks about, so, so when China's pressed, well, what is your alternative vision? You don't like the current system. What is your alternative vision? When China talks about a community of common destiny, kind of these abstractions, the more that China's power and influence grow, the more these abstract conceptions take on an ominous valence, not only for China's neighbors, but for countries further afield. So it's the United States, Germany, France. So I think a network of alliances, uh, number one, uh, the international order that the United States leads, those are critical uh, competitive advantages. Um, and then there's one one last point uh, that I, and then on the point about ideology, absolutely. So. I think that, do I think that ideological confrontation is, I think that the ideological confrontation that exists in the Cold War, I think that there was perhaps a sharper point on it. It was perhaps more pronounced, but it, the, the ideological dimension of competition today, it is becoming more pronounced. And Corey is absolutely right. Uh, there's a very good chance that India could, so India next year is projected to become the world's most populous country. Uh, there's a, a good chance that India could overtake uh, China as the world's largest economy, perhaps by at some point uh, in the century, but the United States doesn't react to the growth in Indian power the same way it reacts to a growth in Chinese power for the reasons that Corey mentioned. India is the world's largest democracy. It's a flourishing democracy. The United States and India, in terms of their value, in terms of the values that they espouse and promulgate, they're basically simpatico. And so I think that one of the challenges for the United States in thinking about how to deal with China and Russia is 30 years ago, so if we rewind the clock to 30 years ago, there was a real sense, maybe not a judgment, I think judgment would be too strong, but I think that there was a fervent hope, maybe I'll say hope, not, not judgment or conviction, but there was a hope certainly that democracy and capitalism would now go from strength to strength, not uncontested, not unchallenged, but that they would be confidently ascendant. And I think it's very jarring that just 30 years after that hope really expressed itself, that the two countries that are now principally contesting the United States are two countries that ideologically, in many ways, are antithetical to the United States. So I do think that to Corey's point, that ideological aspect of competition, it's becoming more pronounced. And so one of the biggest challenges for the United States is going to be not only how do we ensure that America's own democracy can deliver, and I think that proving that America's democracy can deliver is going to be critically important, but how do we ensure democracies writ uh, broadly, America's democratic allies and partners, how can we collectively ensure resilience against uh, authoritarian uh, coercion? So I think demonstrating at home that democracy can deliver and demonstrating that democracies can mobilize collective action to address the pressing challenges of the day, that's going to be a big imperative of our time. Okay, so I myself have, have one question for each of our two speakers, and I wanted to emphasize to our audience that you can send in questions to the Q&A function, and uh, it will be my pleasure to ask them uh, of our of our speakers. So please, if you have questions now, you can send them in or just whenever they uh, occur to you. But uh, two final ones for me and the first for, for Corey and the second for uh, for Ali and they're, and they're different questions. Uh, for Corey, one of the things I wanted to just ask you about is one of the things I pulled from uh, Ali's excellent book uh, is this notion of opportunity. Uh, and it does seem a potential risk. I think I'm paraphrasing you correctly here, Ali, that if we are too rigorously attached to the notion of great power competition, we might see the world too much through the lens of crisis and too little through the lens of opportunity. And maybe it's a bit more of a China question at this point than it is a Russia question because there aren't many opportunities uh, in the Russia policy space, at least not of the, uh, of the conventional kind, but it is a criticism sometimes of US policy toward China and toward Asia that sort of like we're trying to fill the space where China is, but we don't offer people enough uh, economic opportunity or political opportunity. So I just wanted to get your thoughts about this balance between a foreign policy of opportunity and a foreign policy of crisis. So a foreign policy of crisis 
is almost by definition bad strategy, right? Because <laughs> you don't win games with defense. You actually have to put points on the board, which means you have to actually take opportunity, create and make good use of opportunities. Um, and my major criticism of the Biden administration's national security strategy is that it over-militarizes the China problem without producing a military that can achieve its aims. And what America's friends in Asia are pleading for from us is not a war with China and not a great ideological crusade of democracy versus autocracy. What they want from us and what the Biden strategy fails to give them is a plausible economic path for all of us to reduce our reliance on the Chinese economy. There is general appreciation of China's mendacity and malevolence, but the Biden administration is silent on market access, on international economic strategy. They did not take the opportunity to rejoin the what was initially the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership. So you can't have a successful strategy that doesn't have, or you can at very high cost, have a successful strategy that doesn't have an economic component to it. And because the Biden administration is basically protectionist, um, they are uh, limiting our ability to bring countries on side. And you, you can actually see it now in the negotiations going on with Japan and the Netherlands over restricting chip component exports to China, that, that we're missing a very important part of good strategy. That said, um, the United States is generally pretty good. Uh, I don't share Ali's uh, description of the 30 years after the Cold War as one of complacency given NATO expansion, the negotiation of trade pacts, um, uh, and uh, lots of other, uh, bought the Bush administration's PEPFAR program, which is one of the best things the United States has ever done and really shaped how the 54 countries of the African continent look at American foreign policy. Um, but I take Ali's point that we should be a lot more dynamic and a lot more creative. Because again, I mean, the, the thing about the United States is that the churn and the experimentation, the build a better mousetrap dynamism is actually what makes us successful. And I always despair when people think there was a time when American foreign policy was dominated by, by you know, great statesmen rather than tawdry domestic politicians. And we developed a policy that, you know, like the Colossus of Rhodes stood astride the world with um, equanimity. Because I can't find that time. We are and we have always been a country dynamic enough to come up with MNRA vaccines, not just one, but several. Um, wealthy enough to provide them to the entirety of our population and to have some to spare for the rest of the world. But third, a country where a third of Americans will not take that free vaccine, right? It, it's a big, messy process governing over diversity, and it always has been. And so we don't do ourselves any favor by pretending we're better than we are. But what we genuinely are is better than the competition. <laughs> okay, let me turn uh, to, to, to Ali, of course, you can dip back uh, to previous points. And let me also mention again to our audience that everybody is most welcome to send in uh, questions for the, the conversation. But Ali, I wanted to pick up a somewhat different thread and just ask you very explicitly about it. Uh, I think in theory, I couldn't agree more with you that there's a need to, in a sense, live with Russia and China because they're not gonna disappear. Uh, and the sort of World War II style conquest of these two countries is, is, is not in the cards. And so 
uh, in the way that George Kennan thought about containment as a kind of long-term strategy that uh, didn't assume the vanishing of the Soviet Union or the, or the quick vanishing of the Soviet Union. We have to think in those, in those terms uh, and use the term cohabitation. Uh, and you, know, you can see the Biden administration navigating this in many ways with China, that they're you know, sort of uh, areas of rising tension, but there are ways in which that tension gets kind of pulled back uh, in some respects. I think with Russia, the, the question is a much, much harder one to answer. And I'm presuming that you wrote the book before the February 22 uh, war. Uh, and I know what it's like to do a book that's on foreign affairs and that sort of eight, nine month lag time where the world does what it does. But uh, I, I wanted to ask you about that. Is 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 this a more difficult argument to make at the moment? Is there still an argument to be made about strategic stability, deconfliction, maybe people to people uh, when it comes to Russia? Or have you modified your thoughts about cohabitation. Feel free to speak about China, but I really do have Russia in mind with the question. Yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll answer, Michael, your question first, and then I, I wanted to underscore a couple of really crucial points Corey made in, in her previous intervention. So when I wrote, so I, I had to make two modifications, substantial modifications to the book. One was when the United States withdrew from Afghanistan, so I had to, I, I went to my editor, and we were, all, we were already coming up against a publication deadline, but I said, my editor, please, I, I, this is a critical development. Can I modify? Or, ma'am, may I modify? She said, sure. And then, and then I thought that I was just going to be making kind of touch-ups, line edits here and there. And then, of course, you know, Russia invades Ukraine. So I, I again approached my editor and said, may I at least include a, a brief afterward to the book? So recognizing that, I, recognizing that there was going to be a significant interval between when the book actually arrived in the physical form, and when I had to finalize the text, I, I recognize that point, but I at least wanted to, one, acknowledge this momentous and, and very, very sobering, horrifying event, really, and, and offer some initial ruminations to the extent that I could. Um, the cohabitation argument, certainly as long as Putin is in power, becomes a lot harder. And I think that right now, I think that as long as, I mean, I made the point earlier that I think that Russia has gravely undercut its own long term strategic outlook, but because, it, because of Putin's this position, and because of his perhaps delusions of grandeur, the cohabitation argument it does become harder. Because I mean, we see right now uh, Russia's last minute cancel, Russia's last minute decision to cancel uh, discussions on renewing New START. And so, even, I mean, forget about Ukraine. I mean, even on what a few years ago might have seemed like, well, the United States and Russia, for all their disagreements, we can at least talk about arms control. What we're recognizing now is that it's even difficult to talk about the most fundamental basic issues that implicate U.S. vital national interests and Russian vital national interests. And unfortunately, I, I do think that as long as Putin is at the helm, one, I think that Russia's relationships in the West are going to be irreparably damaged. It's going to become, it's going to become harder and harder for the United States and Russia to talk about even foundational issues that implicate their vital national interests. And so I would say that right now with, with Russia, when it comes to U.S.-Russia talks, it's really bare bones at best. It's, you know, is it possible? And I think that the answer is yes, but it's a hard conversation. Is it possible to avoid a direct armed confrontation? Uh, I think that's a conversation that, that needs to be had. Um, is it possible to have even, now I would have, if we had been having this conversation a week ago, I might have given a different answer. I, a week ago, I would have said, maybe the United States and, and Russia can have some bare bones, skeletal strategic stability talks, but Russia has now made this decision at the last minute to cancel even those basic talks on New START. So, uh, so absolutely, Michael, to your question, it becomes a much harder argument to make. I don't think, I don't think that the argument disappears entirely or becomes entirely invalid because, again, you know, Russia, it is, it exists. It's a nuclear armed power, and it can wreak a lot of havoc. I think that one of the, one of the dangers in dealing with, and it's in many ways, uh, it's more dangerous or more difficult to deal with Russia is. When you're dealing with a country such as China that for all of its challenges, I think it's still becoming more central to the international system, not less, and that sees itself as rising, not declining, I think that that country has more to lose by engaging in, uh, in aggression. It has more to lose by engaging kind of the brazen aggression of the style that Russia has engaged in. With Russia, though, Russia says that the international order has been prejudiced, at least the post-Cold War order, it's been prejudiced against Russia from the start. And Russia doesn't, Russia has been isolated, Russia hasn't been invested, et cetera, et cetera. That's the narrative that Russia puts out. It's harder to, it's harder to, to dissuade aggression from a country that feels that it's isolated, it's 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 cornered. But so the argument does become harder. And and I, I think I, I want to acknowledge that point. 
Um, and so it, it's going to be really a test of, of not only U.S. diplomacy, it's going to be a test of European diplomacy, it's going to be a test of, of global diplomacy. Um, I want to just, and just before stopping, I want to underscore two really critical points Corey made in her previous intervention. You know, one about uh, the centrality of economics, and I, I think technology in this competition between the United States and China. Uh, I think for me, one of the really interesting stories over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years is um, what happens to China's growth story? I mean, if you look at sort of China's economy since, you know, it's like nine, let's just say it's 1980. China's economy from let's say 1980 to 2010, it really did look like China, China's growth was just going to continue inexorably. And now it's not just because of the consequences of zero COVID, it's even beyond zero COVID. Let's say China gets out of zero, it, it, it gradually scales back zero COVID, it's able to, to mitigate some of the economic damage that zero COVID has done. But there's some serious structural challenges in China. You look at demographic decline, a growth model that's running out of steam, uh, you look at the increasing allocation of capital to firms that are aligned with state prerogatives rather than the firms that are the most dynamic. China has a lot of serious structural economic challenges that go well beyond zero COVID. Why do I mention those challenges? One of the reasons that a lot of countries that have significant apprehensions about China's current conduct and strategic intentions, one of the reasons that many countries have been more accommodating of China is because they believe in the narrative that China has been promulgating. China says we are inexorably resurgent and the United States is terminally declining. And a critical part of those narratives has been China's growth story to date. If that growth story starts to falter and if middle powers begin to say, well, wait a minute, maybe those narratives are overwrought. Maybe China is not inexorably resurgent. Maybe the United States' its allies and partners, maybe they do have regenerative capacity. Then China's ability to promulgate those narratives, China's ability to gain enduring influence, uh, I think, diminishes. Um, and so I think a critical component of America's staying power is conveying to allies and partners that we have a strategy for shoring up our economic competitiveness over the long haul. I think that if the United States, its allies and partners can demonstrate economic staying power vis-a-vis -vis China, uh, I think that I think that the, the terms of global competition become much more favorable for the United States. And then and then lastly, to underscore you know, sort of what makes uh, America, America. There's a quote, and I'm, I, I wish I remembered who said this quote, but I'm, I'm roughly paraphrasing it, but it, it captures this notion of dynamism. And the quote is, um, the United States, it essentially says the United States is always moving. The United States, it could be, you know, the United States, it could be driving towards hell, but it's always on the move. It's always in action. It's always moving. It's always doing something. And I do think that America's Kind of uh, this intangible phenomena that really has allowed the United States to defy so many prognostications of terminal decline. It's this dynamism. The United States has this story tradition of not only meeting external competition, but also looking inwards and grappling with socioeconomic challenges and saying, taking up the mantle and saying, how can we become a better version of ourselves? Uh, we're never going to achieve our foundational creed fully, but we can always inch closer. We can always inch closer. We can always do better. We can, we can come closer to our foundational creed at home. We can do a better job of living up to our values abroad. We can do a better job of shoring up our network of alliances. So the United States, it's, busy, it's always busy. It's always at work. It's always trying to become a better version of itself. And that's I think it's for that reason that uh, not, not only that the United States has defied many prognostications of terminal decline, but it's one of the reasons why, especially in view of China and Russia's competitive missteps, I do feel quietly, not not in an unbridled way, but quietly, I do feel cautiously optimistic about the United States' ability to regenerate its competitive strengths at home and abroad. But that dynamism uh, is, is really, really a critical, it's the, it is a linchpin of the American success story. And I, I certainly don't think that there's any other power that has been able to match that degree of dynamism. Corey, did you want to jump in a moment ago? I think I saw you. Uh, yes, but but I think we have sailed on past the point I was going to make. <laughs> All right. Well, we'll continue sailing then. Uh, um, we have two wonderful questions from uh, the audience, and I'll ask uh, uh, each in turn, uh, adding a little bit, a bit of an embellishment to the first question. We'll start with you, Corey, and then go to... Uh, to, to Ali. Uh, the first is about regional powers, and this has come up already, but the sort of the role and the importance of regional powers in a world uh, of, uh, uh, of, uh, of great powers. And I'll just add a sort of second dimension to that question, because I think this often comes up in debates about great power competition. The sort of cross-cutting issues 
that don't really accommodate themselves ideally to um, uh, a world of great powers. And so climate change uh, as an issue that, you know, couldn't be solved by the great powers alone or uh, where great power competition sort of gets in the way of some of the solutions. You could say pandemics, although I think you could come up with a pretty good argument for the way in which a lot of countries dealt, dealt with the pandemic, not as, you know, sort of a cross-cutting uh, global issue, but very much in terms of uh, national interest sort of strictly defined. But the role of regional powers and whether there are problem sets, I think that there clearly are. And so what to do about problem sets where great power competition uh, isn't isn't ideally suited to, to solving them. So I'll start with you, Corey, and then turn it out to Ali. Yeah. If I may, I'd like to take the two strains separately. The sure. first on regional allies. Um, you know, one of the restraints on American power, uh, on American freedom of action internationally, has been that we cannot sustain a strategy that our allies in the region won't support. This was true of NATO nuclear strategy in the 1960s, uh, also in the 1990s, right? Germany walks out of a NATO nuclear exercise because they disapprove of the choices others are making. Um, and, and the United States is reliant on its regional allies, participation and support. And that support is contingent. I think right now the most interesting case or in the Trump administration, the most interesting case was South Korea which looked to me to be the first American ally hedging against American strategy because North Korea might not have been afraid of the preemptive bloody nose talk of the Trump administration, but it scared the hell out of South Korea. Um, and that made that approach insupportable uh, for the United States. And so America, there's a really brilliant book written by the historian Hope Harrison called The Concrete Rose. And it's about the Berlin crisis in 1961. And she makes a very interesting case that we assume great powers manipulate their weaker regional allies. And in the case of East Germany and the Soviet Union, the reverse is actually true. Um, and I think that holds more generally that it is not the case that America's allies drag the United States into regional conflicts. My look at the last hundred years suggests the opposite is more closely um, true, that it's the United States that has grandiose, because we have the largest margin of error. So, so we can be more risk tolerant than countries than a South Korea that's gonna live next door to North Korea forever, or at least until the peaceful unification of the Korean Peninsula on South Korea's terms. Um, so, so that's my answer on regional allies. On, on cross-cutting transnational problems. Here, I think Ali and I do differ a little bit because, um, uh, it's true that we can't succeed on issues like climate change without Chinese and other cooperation. But I think it's also true that they don't want to offer that cooperation. And, and so at some points in reading Ella, Ali's excellent book, I thought this sounds a lot like the detente of the Nixon Kissinger era where we're so worried about potential conflict that we gloss over our actual strategic advantages in order to get grudging cooperation that's not really going to be forthcoming. And, and I think we American strategy, while it ought to look for opportunities for cooperation, it looks to me already like two things are true. First, Developing countries rightly have a very different perspective on climate change than we do, which is you people caused it, you people fix it. And if I were the government of India, I'd be saying the exact same thing. Um, and the second um, thing that seems to me true is that the Chinese are going to connect issues in ways we're not going to be able to compromise on. Right. Ignore 
Xinjiang, and we will give you help on the Paris Climate Accord. And an American government's not going to be able to agree to that. But the good news of all of this is that to the point about dynamism, the first country to meet its Paris Climate Accord goals in the year of our Lord 2018 was none other than the United States of America. Despite the Trump administration withdrawing from the Paris Accords, despite regulatory rollback, um, you know, that the great golden state of California setting higher standards and Michael Bloomberg's money to cities all over America and Apple computers sanctimoniousness and my mom being willing to drive an electric vehicle, all of those things combined to the very messy, you know, American society making choices, even in the absence of American government leadership. And that's the saving grace of the big mess that is American power in the international order. We're not going to be able to rely on cooperation from Russia and China. But what we can do is drive technology forward, drive green energy forward, uh, cooperate with allies to create economies of scale and rules um, such that we are less reliant on cooperation with countries that aren't going to give it to us. Great, Ali. So we'll just uh, turn turn over to you. Uh, the question of, of regional powers and cross-cutting issues. Corey has mentioned South Korea. If you want to say a few words about my favorite regional power, Turkey, uh, which I find mm -hmm. you know sort of endlessly interesting to try to figure out where it fits with uh, with all of this, you know, very often in between. But uh, um, you know, the the floor is yours, Ali, to reflect on the on the role of regional powers and, and cross-cutting issues. Well, I find myself, I, I know that, I imagine one of the purposes of, of, this, of these conversations is, is, is drawing out points of disagreement and points of debate, but I, I, I just find myself agreeing with, I, I find myself <laughs> agreeing with everything that Corey has been saying. So I'll, I'll, I'll underscore, I'll underscore the points again. So you know, with regional powers, yes, the United States, it's, it remains the world's preeminent power. There is a lot that it can do unilaterally, but if you think about the the requirements of long-term systemic competition, however you conceptualize it. So what, however, whatever you believe the United States is competing over, whatever you believe the United States is competing for, however you conceptualize the terms of a global long-term competition, there's no, conceptual, there's no conceptualization of competition in which the United States can unilaterally accomplish whatever objectives it sets forth for itself. So you have to think proactively about, so one, so if you accept that proposition, then regional powers immediately come into the mix. And you think about particularly uh, a coalition of Eurasian uh, allies and partners. So in Europe, it's, uh, it's, it's the United Kingdom, it's France, it's Germany in, uh, in terms of big, big players. And in Asia, obviously, you have Australia, India, Japan, South Koreans here thinking about, one, what can we collectively do uh, together? And not only in terms of contesting China and Russia, but also proactively, to Corey's point, what can we do to shape uh, next uh, next generation technological standards? I think that's that's actually, and I know that's perhaps sort of a sidebar conversation, but I think that's been one domain of competition in which we are now kind of catching up and we're starting to contribute, but it's, it's very, very belated catch up. Um, it doesn't make for, when you talk about setting standards for, to govern, artificial intelligence or setting standards to govern quantum computing, technological standard settings, it, it doesn't sound like the most glamorous topic. It's not necessarily going to, to make a splash on the front page of the New York Times, but it's really, really important. When you think about how increasingly wired the global economy is, the countries that play the most active role in shaping technological standards are going to play an outsized role in determining the configuration of the international system. So the United States needs help from its regional allies and partners to ensure that it's not just the United States saying, we have a certain conception of democratic technological standards, we need buy-in, uh, number one. Number two, uh, despite the United States' uh, formidable uh, military power, the United States militarily alone uh, cannot contest uh, Russian aggression. It cannot unilaterally uh, push back against Chinese coercion uh, in Asia, it has to rely on regional allies and partners. Uh, and then just a, a final point, I think that even though the broad direction of travel, largely because of, I think, growing apprehension of Russian aggression, 
Chinese coercion. I think the good news is that the broad direction of travel is greater alignment between the United States, its allies and partners. But at the 30,000 foot view, I think the direction of travel is good, broader alignment. But if you kind of come closer to the ground, there are going to be bumpy patches. There are going to be divergent perspectives. So not every US ally and partner is going to approach Russia and China with the same degree of urgency. Not every uh, US ally and partner is going to have exactly the same priorities. And so a critical part of US diplomacy going forward is, one, capitalizing on the fact that our allies and partners are increasingly concerned by what they're seeing Russia and China doing, but recognizing that there are going to be differences of timelines, differences of priorities, differences of concerns. And, and part of, and this is why what we see now is a shift away from thinking about kind of a unified, uniform coalition of democracies and instead thinking of kind of a, a patchwork or a latticework of coalitions that bring together different countries on different issues. So you have AUKUS, you have IPATH, you have PGII. Um, and there's a recognition that you're not going to be able to on every issue, assemble the same coalition of countries. It's it's issue specific coalitions, but again, you need the the buy-in of of regional allies and partners. It's absolutely critical. Um, and then on transnational challenges, absolutely, I think that the United States it should it shouldn't uh, close the door to cooperative overtures with China and Russia. But to Corey's point, I think that right now, it, I think that the cooperative possibilities are kind of slim pickings. And I think that what you see in the new national security strategy is this notion of a dual track approach to thinking about cooperation on transnational challenges. So track one says, we're open to cooperation with anyone, including our, our principal nation state competitors. We will leave the door open. But if, as we suspect, that cooperation is either not going to be forthcoming or it's going to be substantially linked to issues on which we feel that we can't make concessions, then we go to track two, which is a parallel track, which is what can we do uh, in partnership with like-minded countries? And the answer is a lot. And I actually think that one way in which we might be able to improve our ability to negotiate with and enlist cooperation from maybe not Russia, but China certainly is, if we're coming from a position of strength, if the United States approaches China and says, please cooperate with us, if the United States appears to be begging for cooperation or beseeching cooperation, I think it's far more likely to be rebuffed. If instead the United States says, look, we're holding the door open, but China, you're not going to exercise a veto on what we do, our diplomatic interactions with our allies and partners. The more that the United States can do to shore up its alliances and partnerships, the more that the United States can demonstrate that it can make substantial progress in managing these transnational challenges, regardless of what China does, regardless of what Russia, uh, China and Russia do, then the United States can open up those cooperative doors from a, a position of greater strength. And so I think that you will approach, recognize, you leave the door open, but cooperative opportunities are probably going to be slim picking. So what is the maximum that you can do, assuming that those cooperative overtures are going to be rebuffed? What's the maximum that you can do with your allies and partners on climate change, endemic disease, macroeconomic stability? And I think the answer is you can do quite a bit. Not everything, but you can do quite a bit. Okay, we have an excellent final question. Uh, and you know we're at that point in the conversation where we should be at the Final question. So in answering this final question, please just give us whatever concluding thoughts you would like to, to share. We'll start with Ali and then we'll give Corey the last word uh, today, having given having given Ali the, fir the first word. Uh, and it's a very, you know, sort of useful, I think, question on which to conclude our, our conversation. So this is the questioner wishes to draw out the speakers on the question of policy linkage versus compartmentalization in the U.S. approach to China. Uh, arguing that history corroborates or seems to corroborate both approaches. Henry Kissinger saw linkage as a means of moving Soviet policy in a desirable direction while imposing a sort of conceptual order on American policy, yet Nixon's outreach to China necessarily compartmentalized relations. Both approaches have produced successes and failures. <clears throat> Where would you come down if you had to prioritize at the present moment uh, in U.S. foreign policy? So Ali, Compartmentalization versus versus linkage, and this takes us back in some ways to the points that uh, Corey was making earlier about detente and uh, and and the legacies of detente. Where would you come down on this question? So, I mean, there's no question that compartmentalization is becoming harder. There's no question about it. And I think, and again, in a in an ideal, abstract, you know, theoretical world, but that's not the world we inhabit. We inhabit the real world in all of its messiness and practicality. In a, in an abstract world, you could delineate neatly. Compartments. So we disagree on certain issues, but we're not going to allow those disagreements to 
preclude us from cooperating on other issues. But I think compartmentalization is becoming harder, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't mean that cooperation is impossible. I think it just means that it's harder. Um, and I and I do think that there are certain issues where some vestige of cooperation may yet be uh, salvageable. So it seems right now perhaps seems like a far-fetched idea, but I think that the United States and Russia, uh, the United States and China, that is, albeit for different reasons, I think that they both have a shared interest in circumscribing and limiting the scope of further Russian aggression. The United States has has interests in upholding Ukraine's sovereignty, Ukraine's territorial integrity, demonstrating that this kind of aggression is not going to go without meeting a, without eliciting a substantial response. China, I think, initially thought when Russia invaded Ukraine, I think, and again, who knows what Xi and Putin said to each other when they announced their alleged no limits partnership. My sense, if, if I were guessing, my sense is that Xi Jinping probably thought, one, that Russia is either that Russia is either going to conduct indeed just a special military operation, or two, if it does launch a full-fledged invasion, Ukraine is going to capitulate overnight. And so we're going to be talking about a war, not in matter, not measured in weeks or months, but a war that really is it's over in, in weeks, if not, if not days. The war didn't go that way. The longer this war drags on, the more China, for self-interested reasons, is looking at Russia and saying, we need to figure out a way to bring this war to a close. So look. The externalities of the war in terms of disruptions to food and energy markets, those are weighing more on China's economy. Uh, China's uh, diplomatic efforts in, in Europe are suffering the longer uh, this war goes on. So one, one potential issue where the United States and China might be able to find some common cause, even though they have vehement disagreements, is can we collectively prevail upon Russia to circumscribe further aggression? It's maybe a distant possibility, but I think it's an area where the two countries could talk. And they do have shared interests in mitigating food insecurity, energy insecurity. Um, I think it's good that uh, after the meeting between uh, President Biden and President Xi, that they now have a channel of communication open. They have deputized their senior uh, teams to open up uh, dialogues on a range of issues. So I think that some cooperation may be salvageable, if only because I mean, my hypothesis is that China is not going to overtake the United States. I think that these two countries will have to grapple with one another in perpetuity. So slim pickings, uh, compartmentalization is becoming harder, but I think that some uh, some vestiges of cooperation may yet be possible. Thank you so much, Ali. Corey, you mentioned a moment ago that no U.S. administration would decouple questions of human rights in Xinjiang or elsewhere in China from other other issues. That at least implies a degree of uh, of linkage uh, in in your sense of U.S. foreign policy. How 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 far would you so to take that degree and, and uh, what are your thoughts about linkage versus compartmentalization? Doggone it, Michael, you stole my answer already. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I think, you know, American national security officials like to think of themselves as shrewd grand strategists uh, who, you know, in enrobe themselves in the ermine of calling themselves realists. Mm -hmm. But that's actually not who we are. Mm -hmm. And it's a great thing that the American government is incapable of compartmentalization mm -hmm. because that means that um, we are responsive to public concerns about the mm -hmm. behavior of other governments. You know, I, I think we just got a master class in the failed attempt to compartmentalize by the Biden administration in dealing with Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia can compartmentalize and say, you know, we're gonna keep oil prices high because it's in our interests. We don't care uh, that you're worried about this. An American president who, you know, starts off by scoring cheap political points by say, by, by talking about trash talking Saudi Arabia, and then turns out he needs something from Saudi Arabia, not only can he not compartmentalize with the Saudis, he can't compartmentalize with my mom because <laughs> she heard him the first time. Mm -hmm. And so free societies do, com do make compartmentalization virtually impossible because they actually care about values. Mm -hmm. And this is the flaw in the Kissingerian strategy, which is the flaw for Kissinger is my mom. <laughs> um, and, and values matter. Good guys versus bad guys matter. It's very hard to argue that 
And, and I think this is actually an advantage in our alliances as well, yeah. because the German version of my mom now understands that Volkswagen is building its cars based on slave labor. Mm -hmm. And that leaves a bad taste in the German version of my mom's mouth. And so we might wish that we could compartmentalize, but I think free societies will always struggle to compartmentalize. And that's actually what makes the American-led international order such a strong and vibrant one, because the values that coalesce our alliances, uh, they are built on a basis of common interests, but common values glue them more tightly together. They make um, abandonment of allies, even in crisis, more difficult. And so turns out it's a good thing that we lack the ability to compartmentalize because it makes our alliances, which Ali and I agree are the strongest American advantage in preserving a, a, an international order that keeps us prosperous and safe, um, the inability to compartmentalize actually helps strengthen those alliances. Mm. Well, thank you so much. So whether you wear the ermine of the realists uh, or the mantle of liberal internationalists or some other group, I think that you'll have found a great deal to learn from in this conversation. And for that, I wanted to thank our two uh, participants, uh, Ali Wine and, and, and Corey Shaki. Ali, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation how Corey has modeled civil, lucid, uh, and cordial uh, uh, debate and discussion. I think you've both modeled that uh, today. And for that, in addition to all that you've uh, contributed intellectually, we'd like to, to, to thank you. Thank once again, the Carnegie Corporation for its support. Uh, and uh, please stay tuned for further uh, Monterey conversations. Uh, and uh, thanks once again to our two speakers for this, for this lovely one. Thank you so much. Really, really an honor and privilege to be with you and Corey. Such fun, my friends. <laughs> well, to be continued, I'm sure, in some form. Okay. Bye bye. Absolutely. Bye.